he sent out his word and healed them. You can call on the same God and say, Lord, forgive me my sins. I believe Isaiah 53, that Jesus bore my sicknesses, and that I have life now in the body and eternal life at the resurrection. Jesus is the King of Kings, Lord of Lords, Savior of all. And every person who puts their faith in him will be saved. That's why we gather and have what's called a revival. It's to revive faith. I am speaking words of power into your hearts and minds so that you can receive God's promises by his power, by faith in his son, Jesus Christ. God, by his word, spoke and said, let there be light, and there was light. God's word written here to you is power. And yesterday we read 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, which says all scripture, everybody say all scripture. All, all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. In other words, if it's in the Bible, it's useful. It's beneficial for a person. It's important to remember this because let's say you're struggling with a sin and the Bible lists something as a sin. Well, the immediate fleshly reaction is, I don't like that very much. But the truth is that lesson is a schoolmaster. The Bible says the law is a school master to lead us to Christ. God is identifying something that could result in your destruction. And if you'll come to Jesus for the forgiveness of sin that you've been committing, right? Because the Bible defines what sin is. If you come to Jesus for it, you do receive it. That is the promise and good news of the gospel. The good news of the gospel is the full picture. Yes, you have sinned. Yes, you are on your way to destruction. But also, yes, Jesus has died in your place, taking your punishment so that you can receive forgiveness of sin, healing of the body, and resurrection unto new life. This is why Jesus says in John 3, 36, he says, whoever believes in the Son will have eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life but the wrath of God abides on him. What does that mean? It means that once Jesus has forgiven us, once he has saved us and set us free, he has made us a new creature capable now of living a new life, not doing the things that led to Jesus being crucified, but living in a new life of victory and blessing and walking in the righteousness that was gifted to us. If that's good news, say amen. Amen. And so yesterday, our primary text was Matthew chapter 9, verses 2 through 7. If you'd like to turn there with me, we can read it together. This is our primary text for this healing school. Because I, I love this story where Jesus heals the paralyzed man. Not only because the paralyzed man is healed, but because there are three events that occur in this healing. One, Jesus sees their faith. Everybody say faith. Faith. And we talked about faith at length yesterday. That was yesterday. Then he forgives his sin. Everybody say forgiveness. forgiveness. And then finally he heals the body. Everybody say healing. And so we know that it's by faith that we receive forgiveness, and therefore we then can also receive healing. Let's read it together. Matthew chapter 9, verses 2 through 7. Some men brought to him a paralyzed man lying on a mat. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the man, Take heart, son, your sins are forgiven. Notice what happened in one verse. It says there was a paralyzed man, right? We don't know if he was born this way, if he became that way, but this was a paralyzed man. Okay, and he says he saw their faith. Say faith again. Faith. faith. Saw their faith. See, everything begins at faith, and this is what we discussed yesterday. And if you remember what faith is, it's Hebrews 11.1, 1, right? And you'll have a translation that puts it in English in a certain way, but the way we defined it yesterday is that faith is confident expectation. Faith is confident expectation. That's the Greek, and it's important to understand that. Now, God will still move when you don't know the Greek, but when you get to know the original text, you can get a deeper understanding. Just like when Leslie's preaching and she shares sozo and some of these Greek words and their, the depth of their meaning, you got you to gotta dig a little deeper. I think the Word of God is similar to the gold rush. You all remember in history class the gold rush? Was anybody there? During the gold rush, you had... <laughs> 
During the gold rush, you had people going to find gold in the United States, didn't they? They'd travel across the whole United States to get gold, to strike it rich. Well, some of them would pan for gold at the surface level right? They'd, they'd go to a river and they'd use a pan and they'd do that all day. Maybe when you were a kid, you went on a field trip and you did that and you found some fool's gold. Did you ever do that as a kid? I did too. So you, you go and you, you, you're panning for some gold and you get some little specks and some little nuggets. Well, I believe the word of God works similarly in that, yeah, you can go and you can kind of pan the surface and you're going to get some nuggets, right? But what those are supposed to do is encourage you to dig, okay? What those are telling you is you found gold, So when you find that surface level stuff, it's time to dig. And I believe the word of God is like this. The people who really struck it rich were the ones who dug down deep, didn't they? Right? They dug down deep and they found big chunks of gold. And as a result, right, they were set for life. This is what the word of God is like. Don't just read your morning daily verse on your Bible app, folks. Faith comes by hearing. Hearing is active. It's present tense. It's not having heard. Faith is not having heard. Listen, what you heard about the Bible yesterday, sure, it provides some sustenance. My body is still supported by the food I ate yesterday. But I'm hungry today, right? I'm hungry today. Yesterday provided me sustenance so I could get to today. And today I need to eat again, right? Faith comes by hearing. It's active. It's present. And while by you being here now, the second day of healing school, you are presently receiving the word of God, which means you're being fed spiritually and your faith is increasing because faith comes by hearing. If that's good news, say amen. Amen. Wonderful. All right, let's continue on. Let's continue on. Let's dig deep and understand these words. Some men brought to him a paralyzed man lying on a mat. When Jesus saw their faith, we mentioned that faith is Hebrews 11, 1, right? Confident expectation and sure that it's done before you see it. So these people came to Jesus with confident expectation, being sure that the healing was already done through Jesus before they even saw it. And he said to the man, take heart, son, your sins are forgiven. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, a lot of people, they celebrate that very real truth, but they stop there. They just stop there. This is where Christianity gets stuck. They go, I've been forgiven of my sins. That's great news. I'm forgiven of all my sins. And then they stop and they get a half gospel, right? They get a, they get a half story here. Now, this is, listen, the forgiveness of sin, that's what you need. It's the first miracle. It's the bigger of the two miracles. If you want to ask me, if you want one of two miracles, I'd want the forgiveness of sin and eternal life. However, on the same cross that you receive the forgiveness of sin, you are guaranteed and granted the healing of the body. It's the same work. It's the same Jesus. So don't stop at just forgiveness, right? When we're reading a story like this, we wouldn't want to just stop there. This story goes on, doesn't it? Your story goes on. You receive forgiveness through Jesus Christ. Doesn't really matter what denomination you came from. A lot of denominations teach exactly that. Jesus died on the cross so you could be forgiven of sin. He resurrected from the grave and you'll have eternal life. But here's where the full gospel comes into play. And that is that Jesus bore your sins and your sicknesses. In fact, he bore four things. He bore sickness, according to Isaiah 53, 4 and 5, sickness, pain, sin, and death. He actually bore four things on the cross. Now you could summarize it as sickness and sins, but he bore four things on your behalf. And as a result, you can be healed. You can be comforted, right? God did not make you to be in pain every day, all the time. Healed, comforted, okay? Forgiven, all your sins are washed away and granted eternal life. Your death is not the true death. It's your spirit transferring from this body to the new body, the eternal body, the resurrected body, the original body that God wanted Adam and Eve to experience. That's what Jesus has secured for us. And if that's good news, say amen. Amen. Come on, this is the gospel. Do you see how, listen, full gospel is a term and people get turned off to it. That's all it means. It means we believe all of that, not just half of that, all of that. And honestly, God wants every church to be full gospel. Amen. Come on. Verse three, at this, some of the teachers of the law said to him, this fellow is blaspheming. 
right? Because only God can forgive sin. That was their point. Knowing their thoughts, Jesus said, why do you entertain evil thoughts in your hearts? Which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up and walk. But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the paralyzed man, get up, take your mat, and go home. Then the man got up and went home. Hallelujah. That happened. These are real stories, real people with the living Jesus encountering a person with faith and he forgives their sin. And he goes, you know what? I want you to know that your sins are forgiven. I want everybody to know that his sins are forgiven. And the way I'm going to prove it is by healing the body. This is why healing is an essential part of the gospel because it's healing that proves God's promise to forgive. Listen, sickness and death came into the earth because of sin, right? Anything that God says don't do or do and then we don't do it, that, and, uh, that is sin. So Adam and Eve are told, hey, don't eat that fruit. And they eat the fruit, right? So they sinned. Sin brought forth what? Sickness and death. This is the result of sin. And we've all sinned. The scriptures say all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Okay? So you're in good company. I'm not any better than anybody else that's out there. And here's the good news. Jesus came to save sinners. This is what the scriptures say. Jesus came to save sinners specifically. He said the righteous don't need saving. Uh, if you think you're self-righteous and everything's good, well, I guess you don't need, you do need saving, but you think you don't. If you recognize, Lord, I'm a sinner, have mercy on me. He says, I will have mercy on you. <laughs> That's the good news that Jesus brings us. I will forgive you. And he proves it not just by saying it to us, but by demonstrating it to us through healing. Do you understand? What did he say here in Matthew 9? He said, I want you to know that I've forgiven this man his sins. And then how did he show that that forgiveness had for sure been given? Did he heal him? Yes. God wants you to know that your sins are forgiven. He wants you to know that. And the way he's going to prove it to you, you, we must believe this, okay, is that he'll heal your body in addition to forgiving your sins. See, remember yesterday we talked about cleansing in 1 John. We talked about cleansing, that when we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness, okay? This is so important to understand. He will cleanse us. That word cleanse had a twofold meaning. Do you remember this yesterday? What was the twofold meaning? It was forgiveness of sin, washing away. It was ethical. It has an ethical meaning that he forgives all the ethical wrongs, okay, when we've been unethical. But it also has a physical meaning. That word for cleanse has a physical meaning, and that is cleansing from leprosy and any other diseases. This is why Jesus always did both, folks. He always did both. He always did both. He didn't just say, I forgive you, but you're going to stay paralyzed. Did he do that with anyone? Not one. I can tell you from all the stories in the Bible, Jesus did not do that with one person. There is not one person who came to Jesus in faith that he turned away. And the Holy Spirit will bear witness with you. And you can go read it out in all four Gospels. Jesus did not turn away one person who came to him in faith. The only people who didn't get healed were people who didn't believe. They didn't think that he could. They didn't, you know, there were a number of different things. But he, they, they didn't believe. The problem was them, not him. So if you're coming to Jesus, he will heal you. He will forgive you and heal you. You can trust that he is going to be faithful to his word. Just like what he did for this man is what he will do for you. That's the good news of the gospel. And here's something important to remember. God is not a respecter of persons. He doesn't pick favorites. He doesn't like the preacher more than the parishioner, right? He doesn't like this sinner more than this sinner, right? In our eyes, he loves all of us because we've all been made in his image. We've all been deceived by the same devil. We've all been taken captive by the same sins, and we're all saved by the same Savior. We are all in the same boat together, Okay? And Jesus loves each person equally. So when you see Jesus encounter any sinner in the scriptures, he forgives them, heals them, and that means that he does it for you as well. That's what that means. When we read this story, this is you. He sees your faith. He forgives your sins. He heals your body. 
That's the story of the paralyzed man. So notice, he saw their faith. This was necessary to receive anything from God. We talked about that yesterday. Then he forgave sin, which is the cleansing of the inside. And then he healed the body. That's the cleansing of the outside. So we're going to talk about this forgiveness of sin today. Are you excited? If you're excited to hear the word, say, I am. All right, good. I'm excited to preach. When we go to Jesus for forgiveness, we are promised that he will forgive us simply by faith, not by works. This is also the good news of the gospel. Your performance will not determine whether God loves you and forgives you, okay? I've been serving him for over 20 years now, and I can tell you that if I was going to depend on my performance, I'm still not getting in. After 20 years of trying to do what God commands me to do, I have enough failures to know that I'm still not getting in on performance. And thanks be to God, it's not performance. It's not Abraham's circumcision. It's not law keeping. Don't get me wrong. The Holy Spirit will lead us to keep the laws of God, right? When you've gotten saved, we're not going to murder. We're not going to adulterate. The Holy Spirit's going to lead us to live in the righteousness we've been gifted. However, it is not that performance. Even that is God's work in you. The Holy Spirit is working in you. Do you understand what I'm saying? He's the one doing that work of making you righteous after you've been gifted righteousness by faith. And so it's not based on my performance and it never could be. And I'm so glad it's not based on my performance because I can tell you as someone who has tried really hard, you won't be able to do it. You will not have a perfect record, but thanks be to God. There's someone with a perfect record who kept all the laws that God has given us. And he gives us his righteousness and takes our sin upon himself. And therefore, your salvation and righteousness and healing and every promise of God comes by faith. What brings a person approval in the eyes of God is not their works. It is their belief that what he says is true. Can I get an amen? Come on. This is so important. This We're not even being Christians till we get that part of the gospel. This is not workspace. This is what separates Christianity from every other faith. Every other faith is works-based, including Judaism. If you do enough good things, you'll get in. Kevin and Leslie know this. When you've encountered world religions, they're all the same. They look different, but they're all the same. Underneath all of them, it's based on your performance. Your performance. If you do enough in Islam, you'll be saved. If you do enough in Judaism, you'll be saved. If you meditate enough in, in some of the Eastern religions, you'll be saved. You'll reach nirvana. You'll reincarnate. It's all dependent on you. But Christianity is solely unique, different from every other faith on earth in that it's not dependent on me. In fact, I have failed miserably. It's dependent on Jesus and the work that he has done on the cross on my behalf. Hallelujah. That's what makes Christianity unique. That's how we know this is the truth is because this is the only faith where it's by God's power and his work that a person is saved rather than the person's own works. I mean, that's a sermon in and of itself, but let's keep going. Let's keep going. (laughs) <laughs> Nevertheless, thank you, Leslie. Nevertheless, we must commit to ceasing sinful action. As Jude warns, there are people who take grace and use it as a license for immorality. We don't want to be those people. You see that in Jude 1, 4. And this is why Jesus said to the man he healed in John five fourteen. And this isn't always everyone's favorite passage, but I believe Jesus gives this warning on purpose to protect us so that we don't open the door to the enemy in our lives. Look in John five fourteen. Jesus had healed an invalid or paralyzed man. And it says this later, Jesus found him at the temple and said to him, see, you are well again, stop sinning or something worse may happen to you. Now that sounds a little bit like something we can't do, right? And I believe if left to our own devices, no, we can't do that. But the fact that Jesus has said it to the man means that he at least means it and that he wants this man to stop sinning. So how does a person stop sinning? Everybody say how. How How does a person stop sinning? What if I told you Jesus taught us how to stop sinning? And here's why he said this. I want to tell you this. This is important. You can look in 1 Corinthians 11. You can look throughout the scriptures. You can see what David says. Sin can open the door to sickness and ailments and pains and all sorts of things. So Jesus, after healing this man, is going, listen, man, I want you to keep your healing. 
And here's how you keep your healing. Keep hearing my word and trusting me and it will keep you out of sin. And I can prove this to you with the word. What he was telling him to stop sinning, he said the same thing to the woman caught in adultery. Do you remember that story? Woman caught in adultery. Jesus says, I have not condemned you. You're forgiven. And then he says what? Go now and leave your life of sin. Go and sin no more. Why does he say this to people? Because he knows the effects of sin. And he came to destroy the works of the devil. And the works of the devil oftentimes enter through sin. So when we hear Jesus say, stop sinning, he means it. But he's not leaving us on our own to do that. He actually can do that work in you. Look at John chapter 8, verses 31 and 32. And we'll also look at verses 34 and 36. It says this, Jesus is speaking. It says, to the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching... You are really my disciples. If you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And then verse 34, Jesus replied, Very truly I tell you, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Now a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. Hallelujah, Jesus is the son. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. What is he saying? The son is a permanent son in the family. You are going to be adopted in by forgiveness and by adoption into sonship. That's what salvation is. You're adopted in. You're made a son and a daughter of the king. And now he says, if you hold my teaching, you'll know the truth and the truth will set you free. Free from what? He's talking about sin, isn't he? If you stay in the word of God, you will be free from whatever sin it is that you struggle and suffer with. If you stay in the word of God, I can guarantee you this. I'll show it to you in scripture. You can walk in holiness. The scriptures say, be holy for I am holy. They also say without holiness, no one will see the Lord. Well, just like salvation, this walk of holiness is the work of God. It's by the word of God being taken in that a person ends up walking in holiness. I can tell you this from experience. Listen, I'm going to be real with you. When I was 11 years old, I saw my first adult film. When I saw that adult film, the dopamine rush and everything that happened, it made me go wild. I became addicted for years and it entered into my marriage and marriage didn't solve the problem. My issue was sexual sin. Okay. How did I get free? I stand before you free and I can confidently assert that. How did I get free from something that it gripped me for over 10 years. How did I get free? It wasn't by my works. Nothing I did would work. Are you listening to me? A lot of people try and fight these things and it don't work. You try and do wise things, but then you end up alone or you end up hungry or you end up angry or end up tired and you end up doing it anyways. So how did I get free? I can tell you this taking in the word of God every single day and night brings the freedom that Jesus talks about. And you will never deal with that thing that you used to be enslaved to. And you can stand before other people and say, Jesus Christ has delivered me, not only forgiven me, delivered me from all sin. Hallelujah. Isn't that good news? And it's by hearing the truth and then the truth sets you free. Take in the truth. Do you have sins in your life that you are having a hard time getting free from? Hear Jesus' word. It's the same. See, we're talking about heart healing just like body healing. The same way you receive body healing is the same way you receive heart healing. It's the same way you get set free from habitual sins. It's by hearing the word of God every single day. And if you're struggling with a certain sin, something that God led me to do was listen to all the scriptures on sexual sin. That was my problem. Listen to what, if yours is greed, listen to the scriptures on greed. If yours is bitterness, listen to the ones on bitterness. Whatever that thing is that you're struggling with, the word of God will push it out. It won't even be welcome in you anymore because you'll be so full of the word of God. I can prove this to you. In Matthew 12, there was a, there's a person Jesus is talking about. If he casts a person out of a person, uh, a spirit out of a person, that person now is, it says unoccupied. Jesus said they're unoccupied. If they remain unoccupied, it's swept clean, but if they remain unoccupied, what happens? He said that seven more spirits will come more unclean than the first one. Why did that happen? A person could be temporarily delivered or temporarily healed, and then seven more spirits come back. How does that happen? Jesus said it's because the house was unoccupied. Unoccupied by what? God's word. 
See, we have to fill that void. When Jesus is forgiven and set us free and healed us, we got to fill that void with him and everything he's ever said. You want to take in his word every single day. Now look at this, 1 John 3, 9. Are you guys receiving something? If you are, say amen. amen. Hallelujah. I'm so glad you each are here to hear the word. God is too. When you come to sit at the feet of Jesus and hear him, these are not my ideas, okay? I'm just a vessel. When you come to hear Jesus's word, he is thrilled. This is the kind of stuff that gains God's approval. You came to hear God speak. Listen, 1 John 3, 9, no one who is born of God will continue to sin because God's seed remains in them. They cannot, everybody say cannot, cannot go on sinning because they have been born of God. Now notice a lot of people, some Christians try and say, well, that's not possible. I know it's possible. Just like a person who's had a healing, they go, oh, I know God heals. I mean, I've been healed. So for deliverance from things, I know God delivers because I've been delivered. And I can tell you that this is true. You cannot go on sinning when you have this experience. What's this experience? He says, because God's seed remains. Everybody say remains. God's seed remains in them. Who knows what God's seed is? See, because if you know the scriptures, you know what John is talking about here. God's seed is, is identified in Luke chapter 8, verse 11. Jesus is speaking, says this is the meaning of the parable. The seed is the word of God. So how does a person not go on sinning according to the word? Well, we have Jesus in John 8 saying it's by holding to his teaching, aka the word of God. And we have John's epistle saying that God's seed remains in them so they cannot go on sinning. So how does a person stop sinning? They're taking in what? The word of God. God's seed is his word. And when it's planted in you, it will grow and it will produce good fruit in you. And you will not do the things you were doing before. And guess what else it does? for you. It brings healing because there's no more sins that are acting as hindrances to your receiving his promises. Hallelujah. Are you glad you came to healing school? Psalm 107.20 says, he sent out his word and healed them. He rescued them from the grave. This is how healing comes. This is how deliverance comes. This is how all the rescue that God offers comes. You come to him in faith, trusting that he'll do what he says he'll do. You listen to his word every day, taking his word every day, and you will receive everything that is promised in that word. For all the promises are yes and amen in Christ Jesus. Did you know that? That's what the scriptures say. All the promises. Everybody say all the promises are yes in Christ Jesus. Amen. Listen, Zacchaeus had an issue. Okay. So I pointed out my issue. My issue was sexual sin. Zacchaeus, his issue was greed. Look at what happened with him. In Luke chapter 19, verses 8 through 10, it says, But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half my possessions to the poor, and if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Now, when you first look at it, you go, Well, is that a works-based salvation that just took place? Because he, he, he said, Well, I'm going to give half my possessions to the poor poor and I'm going to pay people back that I've wronged. No, notice what Jesus says about him. He says, salvation has come to this house. This is a son of Abraham. Who's Abraham? The father of faith, right? The father of faith. And what is faith? Confident expectation. What this man experienced was that when he heard the words Jesus was teaching, he believed them. He believed them. So when Jesus talked about money, which he does a lot in the Gospels, when he talked about money, he believed him regarding money. And he realized that love gives. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. See, when you really love people, you give to them. And if we love our neighbors, we give. And so Zacchaeus trusted and believed. Then he gave as a result of the belief because he genuinely loved his neighbors. He genuinely trusted Jesus. Is that making sense? This is why I wanted to start making clear that it's not by these works that a person is saved, but the works stand as evidence that there is faith. If you really believe what Jesus says, you'll do it, right? I trust that what he says is true and therefore I do it. And so Jesus said, salvation has come to this house. So whether it's sexual sin, whether it's greed, let's go to Jesus with these things. Let's hear his word on these topics. And by hearing his word, he'll set us free. And yes, he will lead you to do things maybe you've never done before, right? 
What did he tell the rich young ruler? He said, sell all you have and give to the poor, didn't he? But you know what he said to all the Christians in Luke? He said, if you will have treasure in heaven, if you want treasure in heaven, he said the same thing, sell possessions and give to the poor. He didn't say 100% in that particular instance, but he made the point. If you want to trust me that there's such a thing as heaven and that you can have treasure there, then believe me and show me that you believe me by selling possessions and giving to the poor. So ask God, God, in what area can I obey you more? What area can I trust you more? What area am I struggling with? And when you see that area, listen, read the scriptures on that particular topic, right? Read the scriptures on that particular topic. Maybe you've never gone and read about what Jesus says about money or about bitterness or about sexual sin or what have you. Maybe because the flesh likes to do this, you've kind of hid from those topics, whatever it is you're struggling with, right? Because here's what happens. You start to read it and what happens? Conviction and the Holy Spirit starts to convict me and I know I shouldn't do it. And then what happens is it actually starts to push that sin out of you. And next thing you know, you're forgiving the person who wronged you. You're giving to the person in need and you're you're no longer committing that adultery that you were before. Hallelujah. This is the work of Jesus. See, we want heart cleansing as much as we want bodily cleansing because both are the work of Jesus. And look at this. We're almost done. Thank you for staying with me. Luke 11, 39 through 41, Jesus is talking to the Pharisees and he actually talks about cleansing the inside and how to do it. And I think this is very important. Because we want to be cleansed on the inside, not just the outside. And he says this. He says in, in verse 39, Then the Lord said to him, Now then, you Pharisees, clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside you are full of greed and wickedness. Notice they had a money problem, and they also had other wicked things that they were doing. And these were religious people. These were the people who know, knew the word of God. These are the people who should have been walking by it. Why weren't they? According to the word, if God's seed is in you, you don't keep sinning. So what happened? They read the word of God at some point, and then they thought they had it all figured out. They pretty much stopped reading reading it, right? And they thought, we know what God wants. And so they became religious, right? Stay out of religion, stay in the word of God. That's what you want to do. And what does Jesus say? How does he say you can cleanse the inside? He says, verse 40, you foolish people did not the one who make the outside make the inside also, but now as for what is inside you, be generous to the poor and everything will be clean for you. Why is this so important? right? This is not a religious work. There's a reason why this is so important. Because God loves the lowest of the low, the least of society, right? In Matthew 25, he says, whatever you've done for the least, you've done for me. God loves the lowest of the low. If we really have the love of God in us, then we will dive in where people are suffering, where they're struggling, where they're impoverished, where, where orphans don't have families, we will adopt and we will foster, right? Where the poor don't have a home, we will help provide homes. This is the love of God at work in us because we truly do do love our neighbors. What he was proving to the Pharisees was that they didn't. They didn't really trust him, even though they acted like they were the most pious and religious. They didn't really trust him, and they didn't really love their neighbors. And he used an acid test. He said, well, give to the poor, and everything will be clean for you. And he knew they didn't want to do that. But we do, don't we? We love all the people that God has made. This is why we gather for an event like this is because we want to welcome the sick. Jesus said, I was sick and you visited me. We want to welcome the sick and see them healed. We've got free food over on the table. We had uh, three um, uh, big pallets of food at the last event. Why are we doing those things? Why are we helping to meet the needs of the body? Because Jesus did it. Everywhere he went, he forgave people of their sins. He fed their bodies. He healed their bodies. He always took care of the whole of man because God made everything that a person is and he loves them. He wants them filled spiritually and physically. This is why when Jesus would preach the word and heal the sick, he also multiplied the fish and the loaves to feed everybody that came because he cares about the body as much as he cares about the spirit. He wants to rescue us from both spiritual poverty and physical poverty. He makes us prosper so that we can help others to prosper and continue what God has done in us. Do you realize that a seed produces a tree that then produces fruit, that then plants seeds, that then produces a tree that makes makes fruit. He wants you to prosper. And with that prosperity, share it with others so that they can prosper. And they take that prosperity and share it with others so that they can prosper. This is what God does. He's the God of prosperity and he's the God of giving and he's the God of healing and he's the God of salvation. And that's the good news of the gospel. Amen. Hallelujah. 
<laughs> this is why Peter, James, and John told Paul, always remember the poor in Galatians 2.10. Whenever you're doing ministry, planting churches, healing the sick, always remember the poorest of the poor because God does, right? God does. It's not just the rich and powerful that God loves, and he does love them, but he also loves the poorest of the poor. He also loves the sickest of the sick. He also loves the least of the least, the people that nobody really likes. If somebody comes to one of these events and they're not automatically your favorite person, that's exactly who Jesus wants you to love. That's exactly who he wants you to reach out to and talk to and pray with and share the word of God with and welcome into fellowship, welcome into your home. Because the truth is, there's probably a lot of other people that already don't like them. Okay, if they got one of those personalities, usually everybody can kind of pick up on it. You got to be Jesus and love that person. Jesus loved Matthew, didn't he? Matthew's a tax collector. Everybody despised him and Jesus loved him. That's what we want to do. Are you receiving something? Amen. Hey, we're almost done. We're almost done. Matthew 6, 24. No one can serve two masters. Either you'll hate the one, love the other, or you'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. We've got to love people, not money. We've got to care about people and not things, right? We've got to love the creator and those created in his image rather than the created things. That's how we demonstrate love. Doesn't God love us so much that he gave us his most present, uh, his most precious possession? Isn't Jesus his most treasured possession? His word made flesh, his son, God's son. He says, I give him to you as a sacrifice. Folks, don't be surprised if God does the same with you, that he calls you to make some sacrifices of precious things to you because you love your neighbor more than you love those things. Hallelujah. Who wants their heart healed tonight? If you do say amen. Who wants their body healed tonight? If you do say amen. This is the good news of the gospel. Both can be given to you. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11 says this. Then this has to do with the cleansing we talked about earlier. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, idolaters, adulterers, effeminate, homosexuals, thieves, covetous, drunkards, revilers, or swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Such were. Everybody say were. Such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the spirit of our God. And what that means is that old life is over. You were born a certain way. Yeah, we were all born in sin, but now you are born again, a new creature in Christ Jesus. The old is passed away. The new is here. The sicknesses and the diseases from the old man and the sins he used to commit are forgiven and healed. And now you are given a new life, a new body. The Holy Spirit quickens your mortal body because you are not the same. You are forever changed. You are made in the image of God. You are loved by Jesus Christ and you are saved by his work on the cross. Second Corinthians 5, 17 through 21. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. Say, I am a new creation. The old is gone. The new is here. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. You know that you and I and Leslie and Kevin and everyone else titled or not is an evangelist. You are all called to reconcile people to Jesus Christ the same way Jesus Christ has reconciled you right? You now are Jesus's hands and feet, right? See my feet? I bet you can. Everybody ask me, why are you always barefoot when you preach? I'll tell you in a minute. You are Jesus's hands and feet in the earth doing his work. You are the reconcilers. Did Jesus go back up to heaven? He did, right? In Acts, he went back up. What happened? They all stared up, didn't they? Oh, where'd Jesus go? Angels had to appear and say, what are you guys doing? Get to work. <laughs> go reconcile people. Go tell them about what Jesus has done. Now that command is given to us. Go into all creation and preach the good news. What is the good news? That Jesus has died on the cross for all sin and all disease, and you are given eternal life, a resurrected body, and you will live forever in the love of God. Sin and death and sickness has no more hold on you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. 
Hallelujah. Thank you. Thank you. Listen, tomorrow, uh, if we get the chance, we may be able to share point three, which is healing of the body, but I'll share this with you to close. James 5, 16 says this, therefore confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. I'll close with this. Jesus has told us that he is the forgiveness of sin. So what we do, like James 5 says, is confess our sins, even one to another, but we confess our sins and then we pray for one another and God gives us this guarantee. You will be healed. That's what it says. Confess your sins. You will be healed. Forsake them. Give them to Jesus. Let him give you his righteousness and his healing. Amen. Hallelujah. Did you receive something during healing school? Amen. Dr. Leslie, Dr. Kevin, thank you very much for the opportunity to share healing school.